So sorry about that. Um, so we're here to talk about choosing the right static analyzers. So first, a little bit about me. I'm a secure res uh, uh, senior researcher at a company called Secure Decisions. So we do mostly government-sponsored research and development. Um, and the project I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, sponsored by the US federal government, so the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. And I also do some work with CodeDX. There's a booth. We have some cards uh, for compare that you, at the booth if you want. And uh, also just to note the prime contractor. So in contracting world, you know, we're working for the federal government, but we're working through another company right now. So we're actually working with a company called Gramatech. And they're our prime. Um, so they have their own static analyzer, but we're not biased. We're independent in that way. So the outline of today's talk. So I'm first going to give you an introduction to static analysis just to make sure everybody's on the same page there. Um, and then we're going to go into the uh, set of criteria that we are using to compare static analyzers. Um, and then and the, it's both abstract in terms of like just this is how you should do it. And it also doubles as these are the questions and the information that we capture in this tool that we're developing called Compare. And so the final final section, I'll talk a little bit about this compare system and show you some of our progress and plans. So static analysis is basically the act of um, you know looking at a program for various properties with another computer program. So <laughs> it's kind of funny like that. So but you you analyze software without running it, and that's what differentiates it from other forms of testing. Um, and the goal is mostly to find quality issues. There's a lot of different things that static analysis can find, and I have a slide on that. Um, and there are two major flavors of analyzers. There are a lot of open source analyzers, and there are also proprietary software that you have to pay for. And so it's really like um, an expert, uh, you know, with about 100,000 hours of experience sitting over your shoulder helping you write better code. And that's very important because when you think about all of the things that a developer has to keep in mind as they're writing code, they can't possibly remember them all, right? So the static analysis basically serves as a way of pointing out things that you should pay attention to. And it really does help uh, make for better quality code. Uh, because computer programs have unfailing attention, they don't get tired, they don't forget stuff, they don't have working memory constraints like us humans do. And so the types of things that static analysis can find, there's a list here. Um, they tend to be, you know, can't find everything. So there's these sort of four major categories here at the top, the reliability, security, performance, and maintainability. Um, they're better at measuring the code level things, though. So if you're if you're looking for design flaws, static analysis probably isn't going to find it, right? But if you're looking for do you have the correct or correct logic in your try catch blocks, or or if you're uh, managing memory pointers in your C program, static analysis is going to be really helpful for you. And it's used by a lot of big companies. So Google and Facebook both have uh, fully built their CI pipelines around it. They, you know, code does not go to production without having some amount of static analysis run on it. Um, Nortel did, they're a big Canadian telecom company a while back. They um, did formal study of this. They found that it's cost effective to do. They compared it with other means of um, reviewing code, like manual code reviews and things like that. So it's cost effective um, and it, it works. Um, and then Coverity has an interesting paper here. I've got the link if you want to read it um, about their experiences with deploying code in production environments. So they're one of the bigger, more popular proprietary tools. Uh, and their experience is that you can always find pretty bad things in software if you run, if you run it. So you're like, OK, sign me up. I've got a Java application, uh, 12,100, no, 12,000 lines of code. I've got this build environment, these IDEs. Maybe even you know what kinds of things you'd like to look for. I want to find injection, right? Um, and you're like, well, which static analyzer should I use? And, you know, somebody would have to phone a friend because <laughs> there's not a lot of information out there. There may be, there are some lists that you can find, like awesome static analysis on GitHub and a couple others, and they'll list them, but that's it. You know, it's a pointer to a website, and now you're stuck 
collecting all this information about these analyzers and trying to figure out which ones are going to meet your needs. And so there's just really not a good source of reliable information out there about these these tools. And so that's where we come in. So we're trying to create what is like a consumer reports for, for software analysis tools. So in the, you know, if, I don't know if you all are familiar with consumer reports, but in the United States, that's a nonprofit organization that has, uh, they buy things on the, on the public market. They have their own testing and evaluation criteria. They test the products and then they, uh, sell the information on a subscription basis. So uh, we're not going to have quite that model. We'll be a little bit more like this ratings.com website where uh, the information is going to be just available publicly on a website. And so that's compare.tools. Um, so our goal is to build it into a, a big information source. And some of the benefits that uh, the two main thrusts that we have here are we want to drive adoption through education because static analysis does help improve the quality of code. And um, we want people to understand the relative strengths and weaknesses of these tools. They're not perfect, but they're they're definitely useful. Um, set realistic expectations. And then on the market transparency side, um, it's just important in a well-functioning market to have information, freely available information about the capabilities of the tools and how to compare them so that people can make good decisions. Um, one of the limitations that we've run up against in terms of benchmarking these tools, and I'll, there's a lot of different ways we sort of categorize these tools, but specifically with this idea of results quality, um, the proprietary tool vendors and their license agreements prevent us from uh, publishing that type of information. So we're having to work around that. Uh, and so this last bullet here on the right, one of the things we want to do is do this for open source tools, have publicly available benchmark information, and then create pressure on the proprietary vendors to make that information more public. And so Compare is going to hopefully benefit a lot, of, a lot of stakeholders, first and foremost, the consumers. And that's the biggest audience we're targeting. Uh, we want to basically, for the developers and security analysts in the room, you know, we want to basically have available information available to them to help them evaluate and make informed acquisition decisions and ultimately lead to more secure software. So let's get on with the, the main show here. So we've got seven categories of information. Um, I'm going to hit each each one. I'm going to do them slightly out of order because um, coverage and results quality are pretty tightly related, and they'll flow into what some of the big uh, technical challenges that we're going to overcome with this work. Um, but this is the this basically forms the outline of the standard of measurement that we're using to compare these tools. Um, yeah. So the first category here is basic information about the tools. And um, one of the first things you want to know is if the tool's being maintained and it's, it's reasonably active development, right? So you can do that with just some basic information and, uh, about when was the latest release. So if the latest was released was 10 years ago, it's probably not as actively maintained as a tool that has, you know, a release from six months ago. Um, where does it run? So do I run it in-house or do I run it as a, in a, you know, uh, as a service in the cloud, so to speak? Um, there are both sets of types of tools available. And then how you have to pay for it, open source or free, what the licensing model is, uh, and then links to the website. So we're not going to have all information about the tools. So, you know, we're going to have links off. Um, Process integration is about how the analyzers can support fitting into your environment. And that's a very important consideration. Um, so Google, and looking at how adopt the success, success, success of adoption of static analysis in their enterprise, found that one of the most important things to pay attention to is what it does to developer workflows, right? And Facebook's found, found the same thing. Facebook actually wrote one of their own tools to do their work. Um, but one of their primary design goals here was to not have the developer have to go off and break their existing workflows in order to get their job done. And so basically we can't consider analyzers in isolation. We have to look at them in their environment where they're uh, going to be. And that environment looks like our, our CI pipelines. So here on the bottom left, we have developers working in their IDEs, pushing code up and back and forth to their source control system. 
We've got a build server here, maybe pulling in some um, um, artifacts, com you know, compiled artifacts and libraries and things. Integration with testing tools. We have few major roles, so there's not just developers in this picture. There's also the auditors and the analysts, and you'll see that um, they're important consumers of static analysis findings, right? So just as much as somebody who uh, needs to fix that problem, there's also reporting and compliance concerns for using that data. And managers, of course, want to see process efficiency and they want, they need that compliance information as well. So you have to think about that. And so when we're looking at process integration, uh, where the analyzer will run, there are several places that it can run. Um, so it can run on the developer's workstation live while they're editing code. Um, it can also, you can run it sort of on demand as a pre-commit invocation. So basically right when they are running their commit, it'll check it, make sure that it meets your requirements before it goes up. Um, you can run it on standalone servers. So, uh, you know, either tied into a build server or not. You can do nightly builds, nightly scans. So there are different types of analysis you can do, and they have different costs in terms of time, for example. So some people run a lot of faster checks in the IDE, and then uh, on a nightly basis, they have full full suite scans, right? So you, they sort of are using static analysis in, in uh, different parts of different anal analysis in different parts of their build pipeline. And a, a command line interface integration is a, just a very common way of, of hooking into um, build servers and such. But a lot of these tools also have dedicated plugins for things like Jenkins. So this information here, uh, just to be clear, so these, this is things you need to consider. And then these are also questions that we track and compare. So each one of these, I think almost all of these, um, are questions that we currently record for each analyzer that we have in our catalog. And so when you're using our website, you can basically s screen on these things. And which inputs it'll require. So different analyzers have different inputs. Some work on just snippets of code, so individual um, commits. Some need the full code base in order to work. Some need to be wired into the build process. So they actually need to observe the build process in order to do their work. A lot of the C-sharp tools work that way. Um, and then some actually just work right on compiled binaries, so you can get binary static analysis. And then where the findings are going to get displayed. So the tool is providing you information, and how you consume that information is very relevant. So again, it can be in your IDE, can be in its own dedicated uh, graphical user interface, web GUI, right? Um, and then API integrations are very important. So there are, you know, various formats for getting information out of these tools and into your systems that you're using. Um, that's that top thing. And then there are also a lot of these tools have dedicated plugins to tie into issue trackers, requirements management systems, and uh, vulnerability management systems for correlation and things like that. So that's the, that's it with process integration. So how the tool fits into your build process and development workflows. Uh, speed and scalability is another big concern, and this just is generally about how how much work an analyzer can do. Um, so we don't have all of this implemented in Compare right now. So as I was making this uh, presentation, I was finding uh, flaws in our in our initial implementation. So I'll show you later. You know, we're just we're just basically getting going. We've got our first MVP up and released, um, and we're going to be evolving that and improving it over time. So these first two we don't have in our system, um, but they're important. So how much code can an analyzer actually run against? Um, and how many projects? So if you have an organization with multiple development teams, um, how does that tool going to deploy to satisfy that that environment? So something that we, ha we do have is how long analyzers take to work. And so that's really a function of the complexity of the code base and the types of analyses that are being run. So what we are currently doing is we ran some we ran some of the analyst analyzers we have, the open source analyzers that we have against different code bases at specific versions. So that way you know um, it's repeatable, right? So we know the number of lines of code, we know the programming language, we know the type of application, its relative complexity, and we basically just tell you how long it took to run. Um, and then some, there's also some individual features that, you know, we can track to see that help with uh, increased capacity, the parallelization. 
So reporting is about uh, presenting information to the pe to people, right? So they can understand it and support decision making. And again, you know, I mentioned that that user interface in terms of uh, present presenting results um, that can often be quite important in terms of reporting too. Um, does it have the ability to search hierarchical reporting? So if you again, if you're deploying in an organization, you have multiple dev teams or a hierarchy. Does the tool support that hierarchy and and aggregating information in that way to report up. Uh, Role-based access around the reporting. And then suppression. So suppression is the idea that an analyzer can find something uh, and you're, you're not really interested in it. You know, you look at it and you're like, yeah, that is a thing, but um, I'm not, I don't care about this one instance of it. So if you don't care about any instance of it, turn off that checker. That's another feature we'll see is, is an important one to have. The ability to disable specific checks in the analysis, things that you're not interested in. Because those will just generate noise for your team. You'll be kicking out warnings and you, know, you don't care. So you just want them to go away, right? So the easiest way is just to turn off the rule. Uh, if you, but if you can't do that, you need to be able to suppress that individual occurrence. And so there are a couple major ways you can do that. You can annotate the source code, my personal favorite, um, provides auditability in the code. You looked at it, it's been managed, right? Um, and then there's also sort of sidecar files you can do, or you can keep track of it in that, that web GUI sometimes, depending on the tool. And some tools don't provide any capability for this whatsoever, and they're a little bit less useful because of that. Um, and then also showing differences. So some tools with that web GUI can show you between, you know, commit revisions, uh, the difference in the, the analysis results. And so getting to the end of this first sort of first section of the uh, questions is this support. So it's basically about how much guidance and uh, support assistance information is available to you. And so we track this in our in compare with the presence of documentation and guides. So, you know, for installation, for the user, and then integration guides specifically for like when you're tying it into CI systems and things like that. And then for the open source ones, the project health is actually very important too. So, um, we started looking into doing this on our own, uh, you know, and compare, but it's a lot of work to just measure the health of an open source project. And so there's actually, Linux Foundation has this chaos uh, set of metrics, and they have even some tooling to run that against uh, open source projects and generate those metrics. Um, but we found it's easier just to, to link to the Black Ducks Open Hub because they're doing that all for us. Um, but you should pay attention to the health of the open source project. And there, if you if you chase those links, there are a whole bunch of metrics about activity, uh, commit behavior, size of the community, et cetera. Yes. Yep. Okay. So now, so a lot of that that what I was talking about is all um, kind of question based, right? There's not a lot of ambiguity, and this this sort of back half here is is. Comparing static analyzers about how well they find the issues, like do they find all the issues and how well they do at finding those issues, right? And a lot of the benchmarking, if you hear about benchmarking, you just see this category, right? But I don't think that's the complete picture because these tools need to work in development environments and all the things that we just talked about, right? Support reporting, things you need to pay attention to um, that people often forget about because they're just focused on this. But now we're going to talk about sort of the main show here. So coverage is basically about two things. Uh, the first is, will it work on my software? So if it's a Python analyzer and you've got a C application, that's not going to do you much good. So it has zero coverage of your application. Um, and then the second one here is, does, does it find the types of things that you care about? Um, and issues, you know, range a lot. They range everything from style and, uh, you know, are you formatting your curly braces on your if blocks properly, which does improve readability, um, all the way up to, you know, how are you managing memory and are you, you doing pointer arithmetic wrong, things like that. And coverage is very important because any one analyzer, um, NSA in the states studied these analyzers and found that on average, any one analyzer will only find about 14% of uh, the types of weaknesses that they they have in their catalog. 
There it is. Um, so you, you're going to probably need multiple analyzers in order to have coverage of the things that you care about. So if you have uh, your own standards that define that you know you you're care about OWASP top 10 and SANS top 25 and maybe the CWE SANS 25 on the cusp, right? And that set of uh, problems, weaknesses, uh, you're going to need multiple analyzers to get coverage on all of those types of problems. And now the results quality. So we have does it even, you know, claim to uh, be able to capture those things? And then how well does it actually capture them in practice? And um, and the utility of the reported warnings. So if the tool's just kicking out, you know, uh, an obtuse warning, it's not going to be understandable by your developers. And so that first question here is, can people understand it? And do they trust uh, and use the generated warning. So if you're running a whole bunch of analysis and using a bunch of CPU time and all that stuff, and then nobody's looking at the results, you're wasting your time. And so the quality of those results that are being presented, are they coming with um, explanations with them, right? So does it just sort of a cryptic, you know, here's a problem, or does it have a lot of explanation? So most people are not experts in all of the things that static analysis checkers will kick out. And so you need to kind of have built-in documentation or documentation available to explain what that analyzer is finding to you. Um, what kind of context does the uh, analyzer give you? Does it give you, you know, where that line of code, does it just give you a source file on a line or does it give you code context when it's presenting that information? Um, does it give you control and data flow that it was, you know, uh, sort of reconstructed from the application? And then this last one is uh, how well it actually detects issues. And so this one's actually really complicated to measure. Um, and a lot of the engineering effort that we're spending on compare is about addressing this. Because you have to run these analyzers against known test suites and then look at how many of the, the sort of issues that you know are there, the thing detected. Um, and it's time consuming. So onto our platform. So compare is much more than the website, right? So the, there's basically this big technical infrastructure behind the website that we use to generate the information to put on the website. And a big part of this is, is generating that, those results quality scores that I was talking about. So coverage we're intending to handle in, ter ter in terms of a claimed coverage. And we're probably going to use uh, common weakness enumeration because that's what all the tools support. There are other enumerations of weaknesses that we could use. For example, NIST is, has a new um, ontology called the Bugs Framework, uh, which is a little bit more precise and crisp than common weakness enumeration is. And so we'll be orchestrating these analyzers, right? So we, we collect a, a bunch of these analyzers, and then we have to run them against test suites. We have to have those test suites. and. Um, and then we have to be able to go through all of the voluminous findings that these tools generate and figure out, yes, this is a valid warning for this test case, or no, it's not. And actually giving credit to a, an analyzer for which things it finds is not as straightforward as you might think, right? So, uh, not expert in this, and I don't fully remember, but I was talking with uh, Bob Martin at MITRE, and he has this example where it's it's a pretty simple block of code. And basically, the for the check that it's doing, it can report in about three or four locations. And they're all totally valid in terms of, you know, there's an argument to maybe made that you could, dec you could uh, basically indicate that it's the top of the block, the bottom of the block, or someplace in the block that are all valid reportable locations, right? So when we're looking at giving a tool credit for finding something, if, if I told you at the top of a block and then you, the human, quickly scan inside the block, that's a totally usable finding, right? But for a, a machine scoring, uh, that's a little bit of work for us to do, right? So we have to build logic that can give these um, analyzers credit where credit is due for finding things. And it's not just a simple matter of just matching line numbers. Uh, so that's something that we have to work through. Uh, so we've already got that first cut of the tool properties, and I, I basically walked you through that. Pretty much everything that I presented in those seven categories are things that we're tracking today or we can track today for analyzers in Compare. Um, 
And we need ways to uh, crowdsource the collection of this. So I've got some links at the back of the, the talk about how we're, how we're doing that. But we've got, basically we're figuring out ways to extract information from vendors in terms of claim coverage and a lot of the details. Um, and for the proprietary analyzers, we're thinking of supplementing uh, some of the results quality data, which we can't publish because they prevent us from doing that, with um, reviews and ratings. So maybe we'll collect information from all of you who have experience with the tools and make like, you know, kind of crowdsource collection of information. We need to produce information about uh, how to use and deploy static analysis. Um, and also pulling information out. So this bottom right one, the functionality to help people learn which analyzers meet their needs is the website. So the website needs to have enough functionality for you to be able to come in and there and uh, answer the questions that you have in terms of which tool. So here's a high level block diagram of all our functionality. Uh, that's pretty much what I just talked about. And so right now, it's up on the web. Uh, you can see it. We've got about 73 tools in there as of April. So this is government-sponsored research. We are doing it, you know, on behalf of the feds. Um, we had our funding interrupted for the last five months. So when I submitted this talk, I was very hopeful that I'd have some preliminary results on benchmarking, things like that. We don't have it because we had to take a five-month break. Um, but just yesterday, last night, uh, the contract came in. So that's good. And um, so we'll be picking up. We, we Our period of performance starts on Monday. So we're going to be back at it and have a full team working on this. Um, so we've got those seven categories. You can go to the website. Uh, we've got a lot of challenges ahead, but I'm excited to tackle all of them because I think they're all pretty interesting. And I think everybody here, hopefully, uh, finds this uh, a valuable thing that we are going to be creating. Um, collecting the information about the analyzers, it's, I don't want to understate how much work this is. So just to get those 73 was a bunch of days of work. And we've identified just in terms of scanning those lists where that's just people pointing off to different analyzers, about 700 of them. Um, there are some really arcane, uh, you know, very detailed checkers for, you know, little problems that people have. So we probably won't be cataloging all of them right away. We'll try, probably try to pick the most popular, broader base ones first. Um, and I'm going to bounce slides back and forth. So actually, this bottom link here, this uh, Trello website, um, so we've got a public set of boards where we're, um, we've got all the analyzers that we know about in a column. And then ones where we've done our best job at sort of quickly trawling the website and bringing information in to compare to catalog the tool. But, you know, we're not great at it. And um, a lot of our tools have missing data. So if you click around and compare and you start clicking into tools, you'll realize, hey, there's not as much here as there, there should be. Um, if you want something, we actually, I could probably go into a live demo. I don't know if I have network. But... We have right in the sort of block for if we if we haven't recorded information about that property, you can click a, a link and basically cast a vote that will that will record on our back end and say, like, I really want to know about this. And then we can basically uh, help prioritize our work based on your needs. So we've instrumented the website in a bunch of ways for you to be able to give us feedback. So we have surveys. We have this click to vote. Uh, on the tool list page at the bottom, you can actually um, submit us a survey and say, like, I really want you to tell me about this analyzer. If you are a maker of an uh, analyzer, we have a detailed form. That's this uh, second one, the detailed tool request, where we've got a big questionnaire that you can fill out, and then we can use that to populate, um, compare with all the sort of question questionnaire data about your analyzer. Um, I talked about the given credit. And then a big part is we're also, uh, you know, trying to make compare self-sustaining. So there's a lot of work we have to do to just make sure that we can keep doing this beyond our period of funding. So with that, uh, that's pretty much what I've got. Any questions? Uh, should we? 
Thanks. Um, so my question is uh, how you plan to avoid more or less overfitting by vendors if you have to provide them essentially with your sample set like in an SAAS uh, solution or something like that. VW is turning uh, off some features in their engine when they're being tested. Uh, so does NVIDIA when they detect that they're running in a benchmark. So how do you intend to do that, that the vendors don't overfit and say, okay, we can collect this, in t this edge case now, but don't actually target the entire family of bugs? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I, I don't have a great answer for the SaaS, right? But we're intending to run the analyzers ourselves. So we are going to be uh, basically running them against our test suites. We're not going to have the vendor doing it. So it's not like we have a defined test case and we're like, here, please give us the results back. It's like, please give us your analyzer and we'll, we'll run it. Uh, for the open source, that's very straightforward, right? We download the tool, we run it, publish the results. Um, and for SAS, I imagine, I mean, most of these proprietary guys aren't letting us publish data, right? So I haven't had to broach that topic exactly yet. But what I imagine is, you know, we're going to want to have control over the execution. If they build us a custom environment on their back end, you know, that's a lot of work for them. I, there's nothing I can do about that at the end of the day. Um, but the idea is that we're going to be doing all the benchmarking of the tools ourselves. So that's, we control the test app harness, right? I have two questions. Um, one is, how do you plan to keep up to date? Yeah. Because tools, you know, start supporting new languages, features, et cetera. Yeah. And the second question is, what kind of benchmarks are you going to be using? Is it something that you developed open source? Because again, if SAS tool knows which benchmark you're going to be using, they can tweak yeah, the tool for yeah. the benchmark. So uh, regarding up to date, so we've already built the idea of versions into the information that we track of the analyzers. So uh, I wish I had this up. So um, basically when we record information against an analyzer, we record it, we, it's, it's tied to a version of that. And then um, so basically on our back end, we can just create a new version and then bump the things. It automatically copies over all the data and then we can just tweak what's changed, right? And then on the web UI on the top right, there's a drop down and you can choose which version if we have multiple versions documented. So I think that's going to do pretty well. And then uh, regarding the gaming of the, the test suites. So I can't control, you know, the test suites are, are really expensive to develop. So for the C, C++ and Java, we're going to be probably using Juliet which is a NIST uh, uh, SATE data set. And so that's, that's test cases. They, uh, there's a positive test case and a negative test case for each type of weakness. So one that actually implements the type of weakness and then one that looks like it does but doesn't. And so what you can do with that is if, you know, you can check to make sure that the tool correctly captures positives on all the test cases that are positive. And then you can, uh, the idea of discrimination is you know, a quick way to get a hundred percent score is just flag yes on everything, right? But if you flag yes on the no's, then you, you lose points for that, right? So, and we calculate different metrics. So different metrics, uh, there's, you know, recall, there's precision, accuracy, discrimination. Um, but just so right now, the primary goal is Juliet and, uh, Juliet benchmarks. There are also some, um, NIST has uh, CVE data against different code bases, so things like uh, Asterisk and a couple other open source projects, and you have publicly disclosed vulnerabilities, the CVEs in those uh, code bases. So you can um, run against those code bases. That's more realistic code. It's not just test case code. Uh, we'll, we'll probably try to do that also, but that's, then we're limited in which metrics we can calculate because there's a lot of other findings that pop up in those code bases and, um, they're basically noise to us because we don't know whether they're valid or not. So we can't, and yeah, you can't calculate all the metrics when you, you run against those code bases. Uh, I had one other thing to say. Um, oh, right. So uh, Grammatech also has some work that they're doing um, on bug injection, and which is actually really interesting. So basically, that's where you have your a code base, and you specifically modify it to inject bugs into it. And then you have you know, a known location of a known type of defect that you've injected. You run it. It's got some limitations right now. It's early research. 
Notably, it can only inject one vulnerability at a time, so that's a lot of runs in order to get a decent amount of coverage. Um, but that's something that we might might be able to do, and then you might, you know, if that'll probably require additional funding beyond what we can do in this initial period. Um, but you could imagine, you know, you download a tool, you inject bugs into your own code base, and then you run, and we have a benchmarking suite that you kind of download and run locally, privately. So that's an idea we've been toying with. We're not in love with it because uh, it makes a lot, it's it's complicated to deploy software and give peop other people tools to run and then uh, automatically extract information and all those uh, giving the tools credit problems that I mentioned. There's a lot of automation that we have to write to make that feasible. Um, so right now we're, we're going to use Juliet and maybe some of the open source benchmarks. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> in, in one of your slides you said uh, the tool can only detect 14 per percent of the weaknesses. Yeah. So uh, that is that uh, not a small number? Yes, that's a small number. But uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, um, I do say, how, how accurate is, is is the number? I mean, it, so 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 NSA ran that. So uh, just to, to explain a little bit how that number came about. So uh, NSA Center for Assured Software. Um, got a bunch of these analyzers, had their own, I think they ran it on Juliet, actually version 1.2, and they run the analyzers against that test suite, and then they have their own classification of the test cases. So, that, you know, there, I forgot how many, it's like a thousand or two thousand test cases in the Juliet test suite, it's a lot. And for every single one, they, they basically categorize it into one of about six categories. They had their own top level grouping. And then what they did is they saw, you know, did this tool, you know, tool A, tool B, tool C, and they, and they kept them anonymous like that. And, um, they basically say, you know, for this family of memory safety things, or for this family of string manipulation things, um, how many of the test cases did each tool identify? And so when you break out all those test cases in such that manner, you get any one analyzer on average, now it's an average, right? only detecting about 14% of all the possible test cases that you have in your suite. Hopefully that, that's not many. <laughs> Hi, looks, it looks re really good and I'm going to check it out in quite a lot of detail. And I know it's early for SaaS, but, uh, but looking towards the future, are you also consider other uh, families of tools like DAST, IS, and... I'd love to. <laughs> As in, are there concrete plans or just not? Um, no. So I can't promise that, right? So how do you uh, plan to solve the problem where uh, when people have done benchmarking in the past, vendors have kind of optimized for the long tail of stuff that's easy to find but low severity, whereas like from a consumer standpoint, you want to make sure you can find the highest severity stuff. Is there any plan to address that? Yeah. So when we are uh, reporting out it through the web UI, right, the types of things that you care about, I, I definitely want to, you to be able to put into our system, these are the types of issues I care about, right? And then you can basically, and then the system, it's not that complicated once you have, like, the weaknesses that you care about identified for me to have a weighting algorithm that just gives you a score. Right. So that way you can, you can basically, and that's very important to me, right? Because I want you to be able to say like, no, these are the things that I care about. I don't care about all that style stuff, right? Like that's nice and readable code is great. But what I really want to find is all my injection problems, right? So I want you to be able to come in, say injection is my top concern and then have the system kick back all the tools that do well against injection. All right, we have room for one final question, and it's coming from the back of the room. Uh, what about uh, configuration? So some of these tools have uh, like a thousand configuration options that you can fine-tune yeah. to increase false uh, negatives or like decrease false positives. And like, do you, do you assume a default configuration or do you like run them in a couple of different configurations? Right now, the benchmarking that we've done, um, we've used the stock configuration. So pretty much as the vendor gives it to you or, you know, the maker, if it's an open source, um, that just seemed like the safest way because 
yeah, you're right. There are a gajillion knobs and whistles to change. And, um, you know, it might come that one of the ideas we've also had is that uh, maybe, you know, um, coming up with recommended configurations is very important. That might be something that people care about even more than which analyzer to use. So, you know, to the extent that you guys are already using static analysis and you have your tools selected and you're looking for the optimal configurations, maybe that's something that we should focus on. Um, so I'm willing to, if people feel that way, like, let me know and we can maybe sh shift our direction of what, w what we work on. But right now we're just planning to use the stock configurations because that's the safest. All right. Thank you all for joining. Uh, next talk in this room. Oh, wait. Uh, the next uh, item on the list is the lunch. So don't forget to eat. It's very important. And Christopher, thank you.